In the dead of winter, the Arctic is a dark and alien ocean. Even with the return of summer's eternal sun and the awakening of this frozen world, it remains one of the harshest places on Earth. Sometimes creatures must navigate a deadly course between giant shifting blocks of ice. Journey with us and explore the northern reaches of our planet in National Geographic's Arctic Kingdom, Life at the Edge. Surely this is hatred. Each night, the African plains become a battlefield for this ancient blood feud. A shocking look at a dark side of nature. Eternal enemies, lions and hyenas. In an ancient weathered gorge in Tanzania lies the home of one of nature's most misunderstood creatures, the Rappel's griffon vulture. Although reviled, vultures and other notorious scavengers are vital to life in this hard land. In fact, these heralds of death may be ultimately responsible for keeping the vast savanna healthy and bountiful. So each day, the griffin rides the wind, its massive wings carrying it on an epic journey. Every morning, the gorge comes alive as hundreds of hungry vultures take to the air. This is one of the largest colonies of these graceful animals in all of Africa. Griffins are huge birds, weighing up to 20 pounds apiece but the warm air currents rising off the plains act as elevators, lifting these heavy vultures miles into the sky. From up here, the feast of the Serengeti spreads out before them. Millions of animals roam this, the world's richest meadow, eating, giving birth, and dying. Without the scavengers, this would be one huge trash heap. The mighty crater of Ngorongoro home to more than 20,000 creatures, is a promise of plenty for the vultures. Hanging on the wind, they are alert to any disturbance on the ground. The first hint that death may stalk the savanna. Distracted by rivalry, two male Congonis are blind to more pressing concerns.
their keen eyesight, the griffins have seen everything from two miles up. The first one is on its way down long before the Congoni's heart has stopped beating. The lioness hasn't much time. Making the kill is only half the battle, the easy half. Vultures always watch each other. When one descends, the others follow, knowing there's a chance of a meal. The lioness must act quickly. Alone, she stands little chance of defending her prize. Her only hope, to conceal the carcass, which is no simple task. But the lioness is too late. Company is on its way. The vultures are cautious at the outset. They don't like to challenge predators directly or alone. They wait for their numbers to build up for the right moment. There are no secrets on the Serengeti. The vulture's descent has been visible from far away and spotted hyenas know exactly what to make of this commotion. can easily stand off one or two hyenas, but she's badly outnumbered. <laughs> Given half a chance, the vultures don't hold back. The opportunity to steal an entire lion kill is unusual. Nothing to be passed up lightly. With barbed tongues, the griffins strip the soft flesh from the bones in seconds. The lioness is reluctant to leave. She needs a little extra encouragement. Now, perhaps the hyenas can feed. But by the time they get back, the banquet is nearly over. Even sated with meat, the griffins are unwilling to make way for the newcomer. It just doesn't seem fair. Within a few short minutes, only bones remain. There's hardly a spare rib left to satisfy the black-backed jackal. And for a late hooded vulture, there are only scraps. But the griffins have feasted so much, it's hard to get airborne. Twenty million years ago, Africa's Great Rift Valley was born. Molten lava rose up through the rock to build a landscape of volcanoes. It is this volcanic ash, rich in minerals, that is the source of the Serengeti's remarkable fertility. But at the end of the dry season, these grasslands start to look more like deserts. The migrant herds of wildebeest, exhausted and parched, endure the sweltering days. One vital ingredient has been missing for far too long. Then, at 
at last, relief arrives, sweeping in from the Indian Ocean. Precious moisture. This is more than just rain, more than drinking water. This is nature's catalyst. Percolating deep into the soil, the moisture is the key to life. A wondrous alchemy now occurs. The mud undergoes a rapid transformation. Water, minerals, and sunshine, a potent mix. Within days, the Serengeti is a brilliant, hopeful green. The rains herald the arrival of over a million wildebeest coming to feast on the rich grasses. The storms arouse another creature deep within the soil. the dung beetle. Its emergence coincides with the arrival of the migration. The air soon fills with the beat of these mini wings. As though in celebration of life itself, millions of other tiny wings revel in the rebirth of the Serengeti. After a year underground, some beetles are a bit sleepy. And they're almost blind. They navigate more by scent than eyesight, tracking the irresistible smell of dung. There's no shortage of it here on the Serengeti. Wildebeest produce 4,000 tons each day, and the beetles love. Like all scavengers, the dung beetles fight for their share. A fresh pat becomes an arena of little gladiators. Rolling great balls of dung, the beetles are nature's garbage men, and a lot more. They can shift up to 200 times their weight in feces every day. Spread everywhere by the lowly beetles, the nitrogen-rich dung fertilizes the grasslands, helping to sustain millions of animals, and in turn, the entire food chain.
Some bury their prize where it falls. Others prefer takeout. But even a beetle faces hazards, like a precocious young golden jackal. Jackals sometimes eat dung beetles, but this youngster is new to the game. Still, he gets right into the spirit. There's something very satisfying about a good heap of dung. Adult jackals seem to outgrow this kind of indulgence. It doesn't matter, they're built for bouncing. Like all the grazers in the Serengeti, even a leopard tortoise owes a debt to this busy gardener. Bandits lie in wait everywhere. Still, he hasn't come this far to give in right away. It seems to be a big disappointment for the loser. Early in the season, dung is collected strictly for food. Later, when the hunger is satisfied, these males gather even larger balls as gifts for females. It's the perfect engagement present. She rides on top while he searches for a patch of soft ground. Just another way of being carried over the threshold. With her nuptial gift, the female sinks into the soil. Underground, she remolds the ball. At one end, she lays a single egg and covers it over. She's out of sight, but not necessarily safe. The banded mongoose is very fond of a savory dung beetle. Mongooses are opportunists, feeding on a wide range of food. But the Serengeti has its pure hunters, too. The African wild dog. Endangered and rarely seen, wild dogs are marathon predators who follow the migration. Among the fiercest of all the canids, these wild dogs are not scavengers. They like to kill for themselves. High above the drama on the plains, the scavengers are watching, biding their time. With a meal in the offing, the griffins arrive in hope. So too does a white-necked raven, renowned for its cunning, it gets a jump on the competition by thinking ahead. It knows where the dogs must go next. The dominant female has a litter of pups nearby. It's the job of the pack to bring meat back to the family. The wily raven is too small to compete with vultures and adult dogs at the kill. But here at the den, it can pick off the scraps more easily.
The pups are messy feeders, which is good news for the raven. The bad news is they're just too curious. Frustrated, the little thief decides to take on the griffin. But there's no honor among thieves. A bit of backbiting might be satisfying, but it's hard to get the attention of a hungry vulture. With three kinds of vulture now stealing the raven's dinner, it tries another tactic. This time, it tackles the giant lappet-faced vulture. But the last word goes to the wild dog. The party's over. And all the thieves take to the wing. In the wet season, living is easy. Plenty of water means plenty of food for everyone on the Serengeti. In these fat days, the scavengers dispose of waste, return nutrients to the soil, keep the land green. But they're more than a cleanup crew. They're the alchemists, transforming death into life. Back at the gorge, another primal cycle is about to start. It's the nesting season, and good ledges are hard to find. There's intense competition for them. Rappel's griffin vultures live in colonies. It's only after a full seven years that they're mature enough to breed. Courtship may be brief, but the bond is a strong one. It can last a lifetime. In the space of only a few weeks, the face of the grassland becomes withered and lined. The dry season is coming on the wind, and the wildebeest have vanished. Now, in all the vastness of the Serengeti, the only legacy of their passing is a pile of bones, scattered horn, traces of skin. These remains are of no use to the vultures. Eventually, they will become food for insects and bacteria. <laughs> the calf doesn't have a chance against these odds. On this occasion, the hyenas are famished. They are not sharing. But only a black kite is agile enough to slip between their jaws. It chooses its moment with care. Only 
a few scraps remain for the small Egyptian vulture. But at its feet, a tiny sanitation team is hard at work. Ants are probably the most organized and cooperative of all the scavengers. Thousands of them move in on the kill, removing the last flesh with military precision. Nest. And there's nothing the hyena can do about it. During the dry season, black-backed jackals rear their pups. Hina only wants to relax, but the pups are still at risk. She's small, but she has teeth like needles, and she isn't shy about using them. But their mother is drained of her strength and her patience. Taking their toll. Day by harsh day, the Serengeti is drying out. In great columns, the wildebeest again begin the long march for fresh pastures, followed as always by their winged shadows. On the Serengeti, fire is the great scavenger. Feeding on spent vegetation, the flames are voracious, consuming everything, but returning essential nutrients to the soil. Unperturbed by the heat, European storks hunt for the insects and reptiles that flee from the flames. Darkness falls on a smoldering world. Forever in attendance, nature's undertakers are always watching, always waiting. dark hours, the vultures are grounded. But the process of decay and decomposition is going full force. The raw elements of life are still being recycled. Stripped down to the bone, a skeleton may take years to decompose. So the smallest scavengers may be the most important of all. Without them, the Serengeti might look just like an immense graveyard. Even tougher than the bones are the horns. Yet there is one animal, one of only a few in the world, who makes a living from them. It's the horn moth. It lays its eggs here, and they hatch into a larva which burrows inside the horn. Made of keratin, like our fingernails, horn is almost impossible to digest but the acid in the larva's gut makes a nourishing meal of it. The sharp scent of decay also attracts a porcupine. It too is after the bones, but not necessarily for food. Normally vegetarians, 
Porcupines use bones mostly to sharpen their teeth, grinding away yet more debris in the process. As the first light approaches, the porcupine retreats to the safety of its burrow. Dawn brings a new day to the gorge and the griffin vultures. They're busy with family affairs. Two months after mating, they have an egg. Both parents typically take turns looking after it. Some nests are rather bare. Others are carefully tended, but each egg has its own private climate control incubating it through the cool night, shading it by day as the temperature climbs. The African plains can provide huge amounts of food at certain times of the year, but not all year round, and not every year. Griffins actually vary their breeding season accordingly. In this, as in all other things, they are masters of adaptation, changing, adjusting, soaring aloft to seize whatever opportunities the Serengeti has to offer. As for the porcupine, it should have gotten back to its burrow hours ago. Now it must navigate a pride of playful lions. Although well armed with fierce spines, the porcupine is by no means sure of the outcome of this encounter. Porcupines are delicious, a rare delicacy, and the lions know it. But the quills can inflict serious damage, even death. Without this weaponry and a good bit of speed, the porcupine wouldn't stand a chance. In the end, the lions aren't hungry enough to risk it. There are other delicacies to be had on the Serengeti. Ostriches will sometimes abandon eggs on the plains. Jackals are fond of these eggs, but this slippery shell is smooth as marble and very tough to handle. Millions of years of ostrich evolution have led to an egg that's just a little too big for this jackal to get its jaws around. Inside, there's over three pounds of food. It's so frustrating. But cruising over the Serengeti is a specialist. Egyptian vultures are always on the lookout for smooth white objects that no one else can deal with. For the vulture, an abandoned egg is a key source of protein. And the specialist has evolved a skill that ensures these eggs won't go to waste. Egyptian vultures are the only birds in the world to use stones as tools. This isn't exactly intelligence, more a pattern of instinct. But whatever it is, persistence is rewarded. And finally, there's a hole big enough for the bill to probe the membrane.
As with every feeding opportunity here, it makes sense to eat as fast as possible before word gets out. News of this small event, no more than a cracked eggshell, has already spread across the savanna. It draws a tawny eagle. Worse is yet to come. The lappet-faced is larger and more aggressive than any other vulture on the Serengeti, even the griffin. When it comes to food, there's a strict pecking order. The same is true for water. During the dry months, water holes act as an irresistible magnet to all animals. This hooded vulture is thirsty too, but it's one of the smallest of vultures and easily pushed aside. Competition is becoming more fierce as the water level falls. The vultures need the liquid for bathing as well as drinking. White-backed and Rupel's griffins gather together to indulge in feather care. It's actually a necessity. Because of their messy feeding habits, these vultures get caked in blood almost every day. The blood of the ones who didn't make it. All that must be washed away and left behind if they're to maintain their agility in flight. Water holes are a great meeting place, an oasis of water and food. In the dry season, zebras depend on this, but so do their predators. In moments of her strike, the scavengers are assembling. The lioness tries to conceal her catch, but high above her, wings glide in anticipation. Once again, a solitary lioness is at a huge disadvantage. A marabou stork joins the descent. There's quite a crowd now. One death can mean mealtime for many. Parting a lioness from her kill is a mischievous, teasing, deadly game of nerves. The vultures get lucky for a moment. Golden jackals don't share their food. They're the strongest, the most aggressive. It's winner take all. Even the blackback jackals are kept at bay. Hungry and frustrated, a pair of black-backed jackals attack one of their own, an outsider who has wandered into their territory.
They mean business, and the intruder will be lucky to escape alive. When there's not enough meat to go around on the Serengeti, things turn ugly, and aggression decides who lives and who starves. But it's a foolish jackal that tangles with a lappet-faced vulture. For four months now, no rain has fallen on the savannah. These are bleak times, but the best of times for the griffin vultures. They've timed their breeding season well, and now they have new responsibilities back at the gorge. The vulture chicks have arrived. Three weeks after hatching, they're growing fast. For food, the parents offer tiny morsels of half-digested meat, regurgitated from the adult's crop. The parents feed the nestling before they feed themselves, relying on reserves of fat to keep going until the next meal. Over the edge of the mountains, out across the Serengeti, the griffins know where to look. Long columns of wildebeest are trailing west, instinctively heading for a place where, in most years, they can count on food and water. But this year, the rains are just a memory. Tracking the herds, the griffins fly ahead to their destination, the Grumeti River. It's a pitiful sight. The drought is so severe that even here, the grasslands are devastated. And the river, it's a river of dust. Only a few tiny pools remain. Up on the wind, the scavengers are witness as the herds move toward disaster. Exhausted and desperately thin, they plod on. There is nothing else they can do. They must endure until they can endure no more. Seventy percent of all deaths on the Serengeti are caused by drought, disease, infirmity, not predation. This lioness doesn't need to hunt. She has a dozen carcasses to choose from. As for the vultures, they're too stuffed to even move. Now the flies take over. Their maggots will clear this corpse away. Baboons are chiefly vegetarian. They're not scavengers by choice. But in this wasteland, meat is the only thing they can find. They settle down to share a few scraps of antelope. It's not perfect, but it'll do.
There's no shortage of carrion here, and more is on the way. Zebras keep arriving at the riverbed, but the last precious pools are polluted by their own kind. The stench of death hangs over the water. Driven by desperation, the herd takes small, nervous sips of the poisoned liquid. Catfish, crocodiles, hippos, all crammed together in the churning pools. If rain doesn't arrive soon, they will all succumb. But for the scavengers, it just couldn't be better. They profit from death. And this, this has been a very good season. Feared and reviled as they are, the griffins are extraordinary animals. Their sharp eyes and hard hearts ensure that life will continue in an unyielding land. The young are preparing to enter this world, consuming nearly a kilo of meat a day. Soon they are nearly as heavy as their parents. After five months of nurture, a new generation of wings is about to ride a new wind. The season of plenty is returning. Once more, the clouds roll past. Once more, they seethe over the land and release at long last, their precious cargo. For many, it has come too late. But for the survivors, it is a return to good times, rich times. Once again, the world is transformed as rain churns the volcanic mud. Deep in the earth, a new dung beetle emerges. Its mother is dead, but it knows its role instinctively. The drought has passed it by. In its short life, the dung beetle only knows the Serengeti as paradise. Reborn, revitalized, the grassland glistens again like a jewel in the sun. The wildebeest are lured back by the millions. Here on the Serengeti, the extraordinary abundance of life is balanced as it must be by death. In the end, predator and prey alike they will all be disposed of by the scavengers. From a vantage point up above it all, high on the wind, the griffin vultures keep watch. For they are the guardians of the Serengeti.
We hope you have enjoyed this presentation from the National Geographic Video Library.